Hey, GovCon Giants family, your host, Eric Coffey here, bringing you another episode of the GovCon Giants podcast. And today's guest, we're featuring Mr. Ali Bay of Height Bay and Associates. He built not one, but two successful federal contracting businesses. And in today's episode, we're going to discuss those companies. The first company that he built developed from a niche marketplace serving meteorological weather stations. He took that niche and then turned that into a multi-million dollar opportunity for himself and his future employees. And then the second company came as a result of scratching his own itch. During the process of growing that first business, he learned about the requirements of CMMC and he had to quickly implement those particular requirements for his company, for his IT staff, and for the customer that he was serving. And so he was able to come up with a way of doing so that he is now introducing into the marketplace. And we're going to discuss all that and more in today's upcoming episode of GovCon Giants. Thank you so much. Stay tuned. If you like, love, want to comment, make sure to leave all your comments in the show notes below on today's episode. Thank you. My name is Aliahu Kairu Etowa Bay Jr. I know that's a mouthful. My friend's calling it Ali, so Ali Bay. Um, I'm the president and CEO of a small defense contracting company called Hate Bay and Associates, and Hate is spelled H-A-I-G-H-T. Again, Bay, my last name, B-E-Y. Um, we're currently we're currently a prime on several weather-based um, U.S. Air Force contracts and sub on a few uh, cybersecurity initiatives around the U.S. Um, second to Hate Bay and Associates, we are doing business as a company called Totem Technologies, and Totem Technologies is a cybersecurity compliance-based um, organization, and we focus on small and medium-sized businesses ensuring that they understand NIST and CMMC compliance, how to adhere to it. We help them develop system security plans, plan of action and milestones, and a process of rolling out um, cybersecurity compliance within their organization while ensuring that it's cost effective and not so burdensome that they would rather quit um, or shut down their business rather than just try to comply. Mm. And right before we did that, you were telling me that you, you want a contract that got you out of your basement into a corporate environment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, started, I started Hate Bay in 2014, um, just out of my basement and kind of on a, well, out, of, out of necessity, like I said earlier, um, I had lost my job and what I knew was defense contracting. Um, what I knew was program management. So I decided to try, try it myself, try the small business route in, in government contracting. So uh, first couple, first couple proposals I wrote, um, I kind of failed miserably at. Um, 2015, my luck turned around and wrote a proposal with the help of a, a large portion of my existing team um, right now, and we ended up winning a 47 and a half million dollar um, IDIQ, IDIQ contract. I say we; it was a team of five of us that sat down and wrote to our core competencies and wrote to what we knew in the past. By the way, just so you know, I mean, a lot of us, we started after that 2008 yeah. debacle. <laughs> a lot, I mean, a lot of people really that uh, changed the pathway for so many folks out there. Um, it's like it, it reset a lot of, uh, of the entrepreneurship in the, in the business community. Yeah, so I, I call it an accidental entrepreneur. I call myself, let's say that, an yeah. accidental entrepreneur. I didn't, really, I didn't really mean to do it. I was a procrastinator. So I drug my feet on on getting my completing my degree, um, just a couple of credits shy when I found myself jobless. So mm. I knew that my skill set was far far surpassed my education level. So the best thing that I could do for myself and my family was just start uh, start something on my own. But you're right, the economic turndown in 2008 2010 um, kind of threw everybody for a for a big loop, and then my my family and I found ourselves beholden to uh, corporations because that's what we were dependent upon for our, for our insurance. Um, some right. of my family has special needs. So, you know, like it or love it, um, Obamacare did something great for our family and made it so that uh, when I made that decision to step away from, uh, to step away from corporate America, I could, knowing the special needs of my family, I could go out and find healthcare on the exchange. Without that, it would have been it would have been un unsurmountable 
for us to uh, to try to climb that insurance hill without that without that help. So uh, that's an interesting point you brought up because I hear so many entrepreneurs that that's one of the reasons they don't leave their jobs is for the insurance. Yeah. So, well, I'll just come right out with it. My wife has multiple sclerosis, okay. so it's it's a very debilitating disease for her, and in some aspects, our family as well. We were to the point back then that you know by February we had reached everything out of pocket. So if it wasn't for HSA or our maximum out of pocket, if it wasn't for HSA and the the money that we had scrolled away the year before, we would have been broke um, every year come February just uh, just for out of pocket medical expenses. So. That was one of the reasons I never even contemplated um, starting my own starting my own business. So when I when I lost my job and was forced into it, that's the first place I went was the was the marketplace to try to find healthcare. Sure. Um, I figured out that it was by no stretch of the imagination easy, but at least it was somewhat affordable. It was a lot more affordable than going than foregoing insurance when you have when you have healthcare problems. Right. Um, so was able to navigate those waters collectively as a family. 2014, started the company in 2015, got our first win. When we got our first win, I, had, I was already imagining how I wanted to structure an organization, a small organization. I wanted to take the structure that I had at the large primes that I worked at and, and duplicate that um, so that I could offer, as a small five-person organization, I wanted to be able to offer the same type benefits that large primes did. Now, of course, my pockets aren't that deep, so I fell a little short, but I was still able to, to provide ample health care for my employees, uh, 401k and 401k match. Uh, we, don't have a, we don't have a time off policy. And I believe one of the reasons that works so well for small business is people taking, uh, it, it's easy to see, it's easy to identify those people who are going to take advantage of you and the company if you have um, a very open paid time off policy. So if you don't have any structure around it and say, hey, take, take the time that you need, make sure your job's done, make sure your people are taken care of, make sure your boss knows what's going on um, and take the time that you need to make sure to ensure that you have a healthy work-life balance. Um, some people are going to take advantage of that and they're gonna do so pretty quickly. So it's been an easy way for us to identify those people who are gonna work within our culture and those people that we want to, to be around us. So at first, I was, I had mentors that were telling me, no, that's never going to work. You don't want to offer unlimited PTO, but uh, so, so far for our organization it's worked and, you know, it's showed us quickly who's going to work out and who's not. So that's, a, that's actually a really interesting test because you're right. People weed themselves out. <laughs> I mean, they're the ones you give them the rope and they hang themselves. I mean, absolutely. obviously if you leave for a month, pay time off <laughs> with no conditions <laughs> or no illness, that's uh, spelling a lot about, you know, you are as a person or individual. That's actually really interesting. Well, it's, it's, I, I think that my mindset there is going to have to change as we grow. We're up to about 17 people full and part time right now. Uh, it's still working, but I think once you break that like 50 person threshold, it's right. really hard for me to have a personal relationship with 50 people as the CEO. Um, so I, I, I think we would, I think we're gonna have to tweak it a little bit as we grow. Um, so that that's one of those, it's one of the things that I, in the back of my mind, I'm like, do I really want to grow? Do I really want to lose this family kind of mentality that we have here at this company? You know, outside sources looking in, I always tell you grow, 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 but right. it's fine, like, we're pretty happy where we're at. We found a pretty comfortable little niche. It's not my personality to, to be complacent though. So I know, I mean, we started in 2015 with five people. We're up to 17 now. And we still try to be as lean as we possibly can in every aspect that we're, that we work, but um, it, it's going to, it's, there's going to come a point where we're, we're going to win another contract and we're going to have to add another group of people. So I'm going to share a couple of thoughts. Um, okay. There's a book that I'm listening to. Uh, by Reed Hastings, okay, and it's called No Rules, Rules, Netflix, and the Culture of Reinvention. Okay. And he talks about the same kind of policy that you that you discussed about the oh, no really? pay And again, that's at Netflix. Okay. And you know how big wow. they are. Yeah, yeah. So definitely something that you may want to listen to about how they built their culture and for a large organization. So it's really interesting because, again, it's very similar to what you were just talking about on the money. The other thing oh, is, check that out. yeah, yeah, definitely. And the other thing is, you know, I have some friends who have like comfort business and they, they say, Hey, look, I don't want to get any bigger, you know, and they literally will work 
like six, eight months out the year. And then the rest of the year, uh, they go to the Caribbean. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, you know, I think that says something, something to say about that, as opposed to as an entrepreneur, right? Uh, we could, we could, when does it ever end? And we could work ourselves indefinitely. And there's always, there's always something new that there's I'm always looking something, at. Always something yeah. else I want to play with. Yeah. And, you know, being a, being a black man in this, in, in any industry in the United States, one of the sure. things that resonates with me is that generational wealth, you know, something right. that, something that a lot of our people have missed out on over the past few hundred years. So there's a, there's a part of me that's always thinking in the back of my mind, well, if I stop now, have I done what I could do for future generations? And I haven't been able to fully answer that question yet. So, um, I can tell you that's part of the reason why uh, I started teaching government contracting online is a lot of people, you know, I, I would meet some of my counterparts, like you said, that were non-black and they would know about industries and businesses. It's things that I had never heard of before. Mm -hmm. Right. And I remember someone saying to me, they had a friend of theirs that would host like executives and CEOs and take them out and they go, that would be a really good job for you. I said, that's a job for people. I said, someone oh, has yeah. that job. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so going back to government contracting, you know, when we had career days, we didn't have government contractors come to our career day. No. Okay. And that's changed because, you know, I've attended career days and I let people know about these various industries and going back to, again, Rob Wong, uh, the interview that I did with him, he pointed something out to me, which was interesting. Small business contracting, last year was about 130 billion okay just small business contracting the nfl nba and nhl hockey combined is less than 130 billion really okay but where are the kids energy going where's the efforts going right we believe that that's a pathway right but when you look at it uh, government contracting is bigger than all three of those areas combined Mm -hmm. And you know what I'm going to, now that we're talking, I'm going to grab the stats of movies so I, we could see how it compares to like entertainment and movies because uh, he uh -huh. pointed out this is a huge opportunity for a lot of people. And again, with only 2,000 companies really grind lion's share, it, it, again, you walked into the industry, I walked into the industry, there's, we could, and it, you know, we can all come in and, and provide value and there's room for everyone. So that's part of my mission, again, with educating um, folks out there about the power of government contracting. Um, like you said, uh, which is actually a question of mine, but you already beat me to it, formal education versus actual, you know, street smarts. And yeah. you said, you, I forgot how you put it. You put that, what do you say? You you were smart. Wait, you were smarter than education told, or something to that effect. You said. Um, yeah, I, I knew that my um, my skill set was greater than what my education said. There you There's, go. So I, I think I said it better earlier. But. You did, but it, but it's perfect. But that's a perfect yeah. fit for an entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, and that's the recipe, right? And again, a lot of people, the education system wasn't designed for everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I think there's something to be said about which you know that statement that you made because again, like that's a question yeah, I asked. It's difficult because within within the large primes, education still is key. I mean, there right. there are there is some value in having real practical experience, but getting that real practical experience and then going to work for a prime is almost impossible. So, if you don't have a bachelor's degree of some level um, or some type of military specific military experience in a job that that large prime is looking for, getting your foot in the door is almost impossible. And on, honestly, whenever I became a program manager, that's the way I felt. I didn't feel like I had the traditional education level that was going to be required for me to do the job. What I found was my practical experience suited me a lot better than anything that I had learned in school, because as a program manager, it was understanding for this specific program that I worked on, it was understanding what our warfighter was going through understanding what their needs were and being able to communicate that back to a corporate level, being able to work as the liaison between our government contracting officer and program management team um, to the original equipment manufacturers and then back to, again, to the, to the users and just utilizing what I knew, my skill set as that liaison. So instead of looking at myself as a program manager, I looked at myself as a communicator. So I was able to, I was able to clearly 
um, communicate what it was the war fighters needed. So I found that more important than education was understanding what my customers' needs actually were. And again, it boils down to clear customer service and understanding what I could provide, what I couldn't provide, and then communicating that. And that served me, that served me quite well. And um, I don't know that any college level course that I ever took could have served me better than just living the life one as a soldier. And again, as a part of an OEM manufacturing equipment and then um, sitting on the sitting on the large prime side, figuring out, trying to figure out what it is our customer actually needed. How did a five person team win a $47 million IDIQ? Did you partner with someone, a large organization? No, um, no, we Past we, performance wasn't required? I mean, how, how, does this, how did that work? Yeah, so for one, I was the foremost expert in this product that we were looking at. So there was nobody uh, else in the United States that knew um, that knew a much as much about this tactical system as I knew. And it's because I worked for the OEM and um, I had a great relationship with the original equipment manufacturer. I developed all of their depot level services and their logistics supply and support of the large prime that first won the contract out of ILS. Mm -hmm. um, so I worked there as a, as a liaison. The five person team I had worked with in the past. So I had trained them on every, on almost every aspect of the program that we were going after. Mm. So we knew it very intimately. We were not strangers to our government customer. Our government customer had known me for 10 years. So um, when people tell you that it's all about relationships and relationships matter, it's very true. Even in government contracting, if you, if the, if your government customer doesn't know you, it's hard for them to trust you. And trust me when I say that the government customer loves our users just as much as I do. And they're not going to entrust someone that they don't know with running a program that is in support of a warfighter because they're there to do a job and they want to ensure that the contractor, contractor that they hire to support these guys know how to support them, know how to do their job. So how did a five person team win such a large contract? It was long-term relationships, um, focusing on what we knew and what we knew well. Um, the reason I lost those other contracts is because I didn't know them as well. I didn't have the intimacy of right. what, the, what the users were going through, what the struggles at the program management level on the, at, the, at the government side was, what their needs were, what their shortcomings were. Um, on the other side of the house, I, I knew all of that. So if you can find a niche, exploit it. Um, and exploit might not be the right word, but um, you've developed your expertise, or at least for me anyway, I developed my expertise in this obscure area called meteorology. And most people think of meteorologists or meteorologists or meteorology as, you know, the guy on the news um, telling you what tomorrow's weather is going to be. That data had to come from somewhere. So where it comes from are boots on the ground, collecting little tidbits of information from all over the globe, and then feeding that information up to, to uh, big air force so that they can um, use it to make mission critical decisions. So while some people see that it's, you know, the, the, our specialty, well, you're just working on weather stations. You're just working on things that measure temperature and humidity. How important can that be? Um, there's, lots of operational decisions that are made strictly on weather data um, go and no go decisions for you know inserting supplies inserting special ops flying specific missions uh, they, they all come from they all have a weather component to it so it's it's not glamorous we're not kicking in doors and we're not supporting any large weapon system that's protecting um, ships of any of any size but um, what we do we find um, extremely valuable to the overarching mission of the U.S. Air Force. Well said. We worked at NOAA and um, had a chance to see them send off those weather balloons in the air, oh. which is really cool. I don't meet a lot of people that are supporting weapon systems anyways. <laughs> I meet people that you know, built the hub zone uh, map or yeah. designed their website or, <laughs> you know, people that, like you said, we, Noah were, you know, with the, with the actual sitting off the balloons and the stations, but we were only there to um, remodel the facilities, you know, fix the air conditioners, replace the systems, things like that. But, and being around, you know, we get to see what they're doing. So that's, I think that's really interesting. And I, and I do, 
think nowadays, given all of the natural disasters, people understand how important the weather is. <laughs> so I think, I think given all the natural disasters that's occurring, I think people value uh, the weather. For sure. And it's kind of funny that you brought up NOAA and weather balloons. That means that we were only about one degree of separation from each other because the OEM that I kept referring to is a Finnish company called Vaisala. And Vaisala supplies all of those weather balloons for Get NOAA. out of here. So no. if, you had one, if you had one in your hand, more than likely, I knew the engineer or the technician that put that together and, and, and made that possible. So we just said, we said at the beginning how small the world was, right? Yeah, absolutely. we said at the beginning. beginning. Yeah. <laughs> wow, Vaisala. Yeah. I think I have a picture of someone. I got to get a picture. I think I have a picture of one of my people. Maria, who set up this interview, she, I, have to, I think I have a picture of her holding it. Oh, really? I'm going to see if it, if it has a uh, vice load. It. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So um, on one of the one of the first times I ever went out and taught students about weather was in Colorado. And there's a there's a picture of me holding a very large weather balloon with all these kids looking at and, and at, we're just awed at the size of this monstrous balloon. They could care less about the equipment that it's carrying. <laughs> right. It's the balloon. It's like a big balloon, right? <laughs> yeah. Which I think that's true, right? That's the fascinating part. Is it a, it is a big balloon as opposed to the equipment that you don't know uh, yeah. what's inside of it. So interesting enough. Uh, let's talk cybersecurity. Okay. Uh, I know this is a, a hot topic and there's a lot of changes. And I had someone on, and it's been probably over a year since I had someone on our show discussing cybersecurity. Uh, now, as I understand, they are putting into some of the contract language uh, that you must be compliant with CMMC. And so yep. that's starting to happen more often. So you know, what's happened in the last year on NIST and CMMC? What's, what are some of the new updates and changes that people should be looking out for, yeah, be well, aware I of? And then we could talk about uh, you know, your preparation methodology and some other things that you guys are, are doing okay. to help. Yeah, I, can give you the, I can give you the super high level um, CEO perspective of what's going on <laughs> with, um, with cybersecurity. Once we get into, once we get into the weeds, I got to call somebody smarter than me. To okay. Up. All right. No, that's okay. I, I'm not going to know the weeds. So. All right. Good, good. So we're, <laughs> we're talking my language. NIST, um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology has it rolled out a, for lack of a better description, a, a list of um, required NIST 800-171 rolled out a list of requirements for the, that stated all contractors, prime or subs, need to need to adhere to you know these 120 different cybersecurity controls, ensuring basically that our country's intellectual property, collective intellectual property, um, is protected as well as possible. Um, on the toes of NIST was a compliance matrix called CMMC, which is very similar to um, a compliance matrix that was, or a maturity, let's say that, a maturity model that it was very similar to a software security model that the US government prime and subcontractors have been using for years. Basically, it's it's measuring your, your cybersecurity maturity level and then basing that against the type of Con controlled unclassified information your organization is utilizing and controlled unclassified information that's one of the most complicated most complicated pieces of information to identify right now for prime contractors subcontractors and for our contracting or program management offices um, a lot of people don't know what cui is so that's the that's the crux of cmmc right now is trying to get an identification of what is CUI within our infrastructure. So it is, it's a big nut to crack. Um, and one of the first large contract that we won about 30% of it was cybersecurity, except it was instead of on, instead of compliance, it was hardening of um, some of the assets that we supported for, for the, for the warfighter. So we came with a very unique uh, capability into the government contracting world. So when NIST 800-171 hits, uh, we thought, you know, it'd be relatively easy for us to get and stay compliant. So our cybersecurity team, which consisted of two people at the time, took on the endeavor of um, adhering or getting us as close to compliant as possible against the NIST 800-171 standard. It's 
it's a misnomer saying that you could ever be fully compliant because you, you can't be, it changes so often, your organization changes so often. You just have to have a plan, a plan of action and milestones to, um, to uh, basically a roadmap for your organization on what you're gonna do um, today and you know five years from now to um, get and stay as compliant as possible. So as, as we started this journey, we realized that you know, other small mom and pop shops in the defense that are part of the defense industrial base, there's no possible way that they could adhere or comply to this stuff because it's extremely complicated. And the language behind it is quite difficult to understand and decipher and implement down to a business level. Um, as a CEO, I, I, as a CEO of a defense contracting company, I thought I knew everything that I possibly needed to know about defense contracting. And I think Eric, you've read the FAR or at least some of yes. it like we all have, and it's, right. It's a mess as it is. So um, now take the FAR and add this NIST standard to it. It only becomes more and more complicated. So um, my first and most logical solution to this was to reach out to an IT support company, uh, reach out to my MSP, reach out to somebody who knew more about cyber than we did and see what they could do to help us implement some of these controls and actions so that we could keep our, keep our contracts. What I found was no one knew as much as we did about the NIST 800-171 specifically. Um, and by no one, I mean no, no company that you would call that's an IT firm or a managed service provider that claims to you know, install boxes with blinky lights and solve all of your cybersecurity problems. Like it, it's, it's not a one for one. Like that doesn't solve any of your NIST or CMMC problems uh, or very few of them anyway. So what we found was that the companies didn't know all didn't know a lot about it, and the costs were prohibitive for small companies. So I I received quotes from organizations starting around fifty thousand dollars up to about two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars for at that time I think we were up to eight people for a small eight person team that may or may not process CUI um, to comply with this standard. So again. I jumped ahead a little bit there. We, so we decided to roll our own. We decided to do it all in-house because it was cost prohibitive. We started this journey in late 2015, early 2016, um, got serious about it in 2017. By the end of 17, we realized that we had stacks and stacks of documents that um, were going to help us prove our compliance, right? So when an auditor came through the door, we were going to be able to show him 10,000 pages of um, Excel spreadsheets and <laughs> prove that we were compliant. Well, that in and of itself was a nightmare, extremely burdensome. No way that anybody could actually stay on top of documents like that. So um, our cybersecurity lead decided to create a cloud-based solution for us internally. Okay. So that we could, so that we could have, you have a little bit more manageable platform. So we developed that at the end of the the initial kind of wireframe diagram of what, what this software solution was going to look like. We were sitting in this conference room and we decided at that time that we probably had a solution here that we could that we could share with our small business peers. Because one of our biggest fears, one of my big, biggest fears was that large primes were going to push us out because there was no way that small business could continue to, to right. support or to, could continue to adhere to these standards. So so uh, late 2017, that became our passion. All right, so we want to keep the defense industrial base um, consisting of the major majority, majority of small businesses. So there's 2,000 primes that support the U.S. government. There's about 300,000 small businesses that, that make up what's called DIV or the defense industrial base. Mm -hmm. So that's who our focus was. Right. This small mom and pop shops that were operating out of their out of their garages trying to figure out how in the world they were going to comply to the same standard that you know Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman had to apply had to apply it to their networks so um, 2018 we found out rapidly that we had no idea what the hell we were doing in marketing and we did not speak marketing language at all we were defense contractors and there was we rarely ever marketed ourselves to other businesses. And that's what we were trying to do. So we fell right on our face in 2018 with, with this new solution that we were rolling out that was going to save everybody. So in 2019, we actually hired someone who knew what they were doing in marketing. We rolled out a platform that we were calling Totem. And Totem at the time was what we were referring to as a GRC or a government risk and compliance tool. Um, our marketing team came to 
myself and my cyber lead and said, hey, how about instead of marketing this software solution, we just market a whole new company. So that's why we're currently doing business as Totem Technologies. So Totem Technologies is a compliance-based company. And what we do is we train from the ground up. We train um, from the very basics of NIST 800-171 through CMMC, um, through a series of online webinar-based trainings. And basically, it's three weeks of an hour and a half, excuse me, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, learning from our cybersecurity expert about the things that we went through over the last five years and the learning curves that we've gone, that, that we've endured and, you know, getting best practices out of the industry and utilizing the tool that we've created to implement your system security plan and control and track your system security plan and your plan of action and milestones so that when it comes time for the, for the small businesses to be audited, we are ready. And it's not just a stack of paper that no one really understands. We're trying to come at it from a holistic perspective and teach people that this is, like we talked about earlier, Eric, this is just implementing a PC in your workspace instead of using carbon copy paper, instead of using a typewriter. So right. it's, it's nothing earth shattering. It's nothing, it's nothing that um, has to break the bank. It sure can, but it doesn't have to. Um, it's just a dynamic shift in the way that we do business. And we believe that small businesses simply need to understand that. And once they understand it, they can start working through that process and adhering to these new CMMC controls. So there's a lot of fear out there around it. And trust me, I felt that fear. I knew that, you know, the level of cybersecurity that we had to adhere to or cybersecurity compliance that we had to adhere to. If we didn't get our ducks in a row and get straight quickly, we lost that competitive advantage. So if we had any, any competitors out there that said, Hey, I'm, I'm CMMC compliant, our government contractor, our government um, program office or program team would look at them a little bit more favorable than they would look at us. So as a couple, it's multifaceted, I guess. Um, one, we wanted to help small business, but at the same time, we wanted to develop, develop a competitive advantage that we felt at the time, no one else could actually could, could, could develop as quickly as no one else at our size level could comply like we could. So we've been holding our hand up for years saying, hey, make us the very first small business to get audited uh, to the CMMC mm. because we believe the way that we're doing it is the only, well, it's for one, it's absolutely compliant. For two, it's the only way that small businesses are going to be able to adhere on a budget. Um, and we've been out, we've been out now for a year and a half um, teaching this to other companies. And I'm happy to say that we have about a 99% about, we have exactly a 99% customer satisfaction rating on all of our classes and on the utilization of the software that we have, that we have out there. And instead of tens of thousands of dollars for this solution, it's hundreds of dollars. So every small business can, can afford it. And again, that's, that's my passion is small business and making sure that we get to stay in this defense industrial space. No, I like that. We absolutely need it. And like I said, this is supposed to be, from what I've read, the year where they finally start requiring it of us, right? So they've said for years, it's been mandated. It's, it's, it was part is supposed to be done, but, but I mean, they've been saying that for 10 years. <laughs> yeah. It's a very slow and complex rollout. Um, right now, the, right now, uh, our government doesn't have enough auditors to go out and audit the hundreds of thousands of small businesses that are out there. So what they're doing is they're, they're auditing a few very critical infrastructure contracts. We've been privy to some of the auditing that's happening around the, around the nation right now. And it's, it's, extremely intense. Um, you know, some of the large primes that we've talked to said it's the most difficult audit that they've ever gone through. So, wow. um, but you know, they're, they're making it through and sharing some of the information as far as, you know, the good and the bad of the, of the auditing practices that are out there, um, with us so that we're, so we're trying to, um, again, roll some of the best practices that, that they found, um, into, into our solutions and communicate that to the small businesses that are, that are out there and waiting for it. So yeah, right now, I think there's only seven for 2020, 2021, seven companies that are, that are uh, slated to be audited against the CMMC compliance, whether it be one through five, you know, whatever, whatever levels those are, the majority of folks are going to, everybody's going to fall into a CMMC level one, you know, regardless of what you do. Um, and basically 
If you're out there wondering what CMMC level one is, if you look at what's called the FAR 17 or the best, the 17 best practices for cybersecurity, that's basically going to equal a CMMC level one compliance. Um, and it's gonna, it's gonna go up from there. There a lot of the DIB will end up being CMMC level three, um, depending on what level of CUI or unclassified information you process within your network. Very few, probably selected to the big primes, will need to be a level four and five. So um, as small businesses, normally, you know, generally speaking, we're gonna be somewhere in one, two or three, um, which is relatively easy to comply to. I, I say relatively, uh, there's, there's some costs associated with it. There's, like I said earlier, a dynamic change in the way that you have to do business, um, but it's absolutely doable. It's, it's just an education. So. You just need we you just need about three weeks of our time. We'll show you how to do it. When you say a dynamic change in the way you have to do business, so I went to visit one of our podcast guests, and when we came in, uh, we had to sign a book with our name on it. Okay, yeah, something like that. Is that what you're yeah. talking about? Um, yeah, absolutely. So you know, having a log of anybody and everybody that comes in and out of your organization. Right having a inventory of every asset in your organization. When I say asset, I mean IT asset. So okay. if you allow folks to BYOB and bring their own, or BYOD, bring their own device to work, are you implementing Mac filtering? Do you know every device that's coming in and touching your network? Are your networks properly segregated? Do you have a guest network that touches your primary network? What type of information are you housing on your network? If you're housing controlled and classified information, is it segregated from everything else or is it just lumped in with, you know, all of your company financials and your HR data? Hmm. How are you transmitting information um, via, via email? Are you emailing what could be CUI um, straight uncrypted to your government customer or maybe even to your, to your subcontractor yourself? If you have CUI in your possession, you have to flow those requirements down to anybody else that might touch that information. So, you know, here internally, we're, when I say a dynamic shift in the way that we do business, um, in the past, we always were very comfortable in, in attaching a PDF, attaching a Microsoft Word document, right. Excel sheet, and emailing it to wherever we wanted to email. Right. We don't do that anymore. We now upload them to a secure server. And then we send a link to our customer, um, even internally. And I'll tell you internally, it is like pulling teeth, trying to get people to always upload the document to the, to the server rather than emailing it. Because right. you know what, it's just, it's quite frankly easier just to it's email it. it. Right. Right. And I'm guilty of it. Everybody's guilty of it. Like if I'm in a hurry, man, I just want to, I don't, I don't want to upload that. I just want to <laughs> attach it and send it because you know, who, who cares? Like right. who, it's, it's such a small piece of data. Like nobody, nobody's going to care. Like what's on this, you know, the cover letter of this TO or like right. the, the insert of, you know, the little bit of information about um, how you do proper maintenance on this piece of equipment. And I just need somebody to look it over real quick to make sure there's no typos. Like, what our adversaries do is they look for those opportunities. You know, they take these little tiny pieces of information and they collect them like a big jigsaw puzzle and they put them together. And that's how, you know, the Chinese variant of the F-35 looks very, very similar to the United States F-35. And we didn't share that information with the Chinese, not knowingly. They we're very good at stealing is a strong word, but yeah, stealing. At stealing that those little pieces of information and then putting it together and putting all those little pieces together and, and coming up with a variant of a stealth fighter that is tens of millions of dollars cheaper than ours. So um, what's the danger in that? Well, um, they can build 10 fighters for the, for the cost of one of ours. So there's a level of national security that you know, that should that should flag everybody that you know we don't we don't want any large adversary um especially a nation state like china being able to outbuild us on a high performance fighter jet or high performance any type of military asset it's bad for our national defense so if we can't stop the outflux of these little tiny pieces of data we're basically, we're basically giving away all of our intellectual property, all of our innovations, we're giving them away for free. China and some of our other adversaries, they don't have to innovate because they've innovated on breaking into our national infrastructure, our databases and taking what we have failed to secure. If you don't lock your doors in your house and somebody comes in and takes your stuff, well, shame on them, but also you could lock the door. 
you know, you could have, you could have had a, you could have had a deadbolt, you could have had a dog that probably would have slowed them down, probably would have kept them from taking at least the majority of your stuff. So that's what we need right. to do as a, as a nation, as part of the defense industrial base. We need to make sure that we're locking our doors and we've got a guard dog. Um, because they're going to get in. It's just a matter of how long they're going to be there and what information they're going to be able to, to take out. So we have to be able to limit that. I like that. I like that. Now, your website, I have it up here. It's totem, T-O-T-E-M dot tech dot T-E-C-H, correct? correct. Um, I'm looking at the webinar that you offer, how to comply with CMMC and this 800-171 requirements. Now, is, have they discussed if there's a penalty or if you're not compliant with this yet, the government wise? Yeah. So basically the, the penalty, the penalty is um, you won't be awarded contracts or you, okay. or you have your existing contracts taken, taken away. If you attested to being compliant and then you get audited and they figure out that you're not compliant, they can take away your contract for lack of performance. Yeah. Sometimes fear of loss is, is a greater motivator than opportunity to gain. So again, discussing, yeah, you know, I want to be in compliance and I want to show that I have a competitive edge that may not motivate everyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you brought up a point that I forgot to touch earlier and you asked a question about past performance and the way that we, and past performance is extremely important. Um, a lot of times the government will omit past performance, but a lot of times they, they want to see it. So I was worried when we first, when I was first um, bidding on contracts. So I convinced my father-in-law who has had an engineering company for 34 years to allow me to solicit contracts under his company. Um, so that's, that's how we perform. That's how we proved past performance. He rapidly, whenever we started getting cybersecurity, said, I don't want to have any part of this anymore. He's like, I'm very comfortable doing business to business and business to consumer, um, engineering support. He's like, I have no interest in doing government contracts at all. Um, so he's not worried about adhering to those, those standards at all because, um, he's made the decision, the strategic decision for his company that they're not going to work in the defense industrial base any longer because it's too complicated. They don't want to put up with the bureaucracy. So there are companies that are going to do that. I, you know, I've seen that. I mean, I've heard that now, even before cybersecurity, I've heard people, they didn't want to work with in the government space because it was just too complicated overall. So, uh, I'm not surprised whatsoever. I mean, I've seen. I remember I had students of mine reach out and for solicitations where they were specifying this particular type of equipment and the, the manufacturer says, I, I, I don't want to sell to the government. <laughs> they're, like, they're like, I'm not interested in selling to the government. We're like, nah. and I go, are you kidding me? They go, they're specifying your equipment. And the guy goes, nah. And he says, talk to one of the distributors. The distributor said, nope, we don't sell to the government either. We're not going to, we're not going to register and Sam or do anything to sell to them. Yeah. Speaking of that, tell us a story about growing the business. I mean, what was that like? Again, starting off, losing your job. How did you get five people? And then how did you get to 20 people? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a great question. Right? Because I mean, I'm sure a lot of people that, that don't have jobs can't afford to hire five people right off the bat. Yeah, and um, neither could I. And that was a <laughs> really difficult thing. You know, when I won this contract, I was, I was literally working at Tyson Foods on the midnight shift. Um, running a tortilla line. So I was manufacturing tortillas with about a hundred other folks. And um, that was a very humbling experience. So I got the call the day before I started a, a midnight shift. I went to work and it's the only job I ever quit. Uh, at the end of my shift, I put my keys on the boss's desk and I walked out because I had bigger fish to fry at that point. And the biggest one was how, how am I going to onboard people and pay them? Um, because as, as you know, the government doesn't pay in advance, you know, they're always paying in the rears. They pay for, um, for services rendered. So I went to the bank and I was like, Hey, uh, Mr. Bank, I'd love to have a loan for 90 days worth of, um, worth of payroll. <laughs> and they, yeah, they gave me the same look you're giving me right now. They laughed. <laughs> so they're like, they're like, well, great on that contract, but we don't loan on contracts. We loan on I don't remember it, it, even what he said. So um, again, it was my partnership with my father-in-law. He um, gave me, um, he, he allowed me to utilize his line of credit. So um, a couple of years later, I used, to, I used about $85,000 of his line of credit in um, the first six months for payroll and just infrastructure costs and getting the company stood up and um, building office chairs and, and 
conference room equipment, that's expensive, man. I, that's some of the things like I thought of, but, but it didn't really, it didn't matter at the time. Like we'll, right. we'll, we'll, we have folding tables, you know? So that's really what we started with, <laughs> started with folding tables and, you know, a big open warehouse that was um, super inexpensive and, and cheap to operate out of. So uh, anyway, had that line of credit. That's how I paid the folks. That's how we got started. The growth came through, came a lot through change orders on the government side. So the government issued the, issued the original contract. And then, you know, there was a, there was a change that immediately um, we, we needed to add another body to help with some of the logistics aspects of it. So then the, then the cybersecurity stuff started maturing. So we had to hire not only our engineer, but we had to hire, hire a cybersecurity tech and analyst as well to start monitoring some of the traffic on our, on our end. Um, and again, that was somewhat of a change to the contract. And then um, we won a couple other small prime opportunities that allowed us to grow a field service team. So we, um, we added a couple trucks and we added a couple technicians that would just drive around and perform um, preventative maintenance at um, some of the missile alert facilities around the, around the West here. Um, and again, we, uh, after that, we got another boost on the cyber side. So we hired a, another engineer on the, on the cyber team to kind of free up our prime engineers time. It's, I didn't have this plan of, I'm going to reach, you know, my next milestone and I'm going to add another employee. And then after that, there's another milestone that's going to tell me to add another employee, and another milestone. It's, um, basically having, having, having my eyes and ears open around the organization and noticing what's happening and identifying places where we needed to, we needed to put people because people were being, you know, overloaded, overworked, or, you know, the, the simplest part was, was getting a new contract and knowing, Hey, this contract we bid, we bid it, you know, uh, 1.5 FTEs. So we know we can at least hire one person and right. try to make up the other half somewhere else. So that, that's always the easy part. It's the, it's, it's growing. And the difficult part for me was adding people when I wasn't adding revenue because the complexity around whatever was growing around mostly the cyber side was growing and I didn't know how we were going to, there was no way that we were going to be able to stay caught up with the current work with the current manpower that we had. So there were times where, you know, profit took a hit because we needed um, manpower. We needed more people to, to ensure that we were able to deliver what we promised to deliver. So I was never promised profitability. I was never promised anything except a hundred dollars is what the government it was what that government contracts said. We guarantee we will spend a hundred dollars with you. Everything else is like, <laughs> you know, cross your fingers and see what happens. Right. Um, so I know that quality comes first. And if delivering a high quality um, product or service meant that we were going to have to hire another person and take a hit on profit, then, you know, that's, that's what it was. It was never profit never came first. It was always the, the warfighter in our case and, and our customers. So it's adding 15 people over five years. It's, it's been a learning experience because some of those people are still with us today and some, some have moved on. Sometimes um, we hired for a position that we just ultimately realized that it shouldn't have been a full-time hire. It should have been a part-time, you know, or it should have been a contract person because really we only needed that person for 90 days. But again, um, our culture was let's bring people in and make them part of the family and, and see what happens. And it's, you know, some of the folks that we've brought in um, have brought, have opened our eyes to new opportunities, um, whether it, you know, we've, we've dabbled in construction now, we've done um, a little bit of work with the Department of Transportations, uh, we've done, we've done a little bit of, a little bit of everything. Um, some things stick, some things don't. Um, I, I think for me, a big part of the learning was not being scared to try something new, um, even if it only meant um, barely breaking even, or even sometimes, even in some cases, taking a small loss has been worth us learning, has been, has been worth the, the past performance and being able to put that on our, on our resume. So some things we'll never do again and some things um, we keep our eyes um, wide open to. I mean, you're still a relatively new entrepreneur, you know, starting yeah. 2014. Yeah, brand, brand new. So yeah. I, don't, I don't even, I don't know what's next, honestly. Um, <laughs> so I'm part of an organization called Warrior Rising. And what we do is we take veterans and um, turn them into what we call veteranpreneurs. So we take veterans with a great idea or an existing business or 
for, like I said, an idea for a business. And we put them through a, a boot camp, if you will, um, teaching them all the ins and outs of running a business. I try to mentor those folks that want to go into the defense, into the, uh, yeah, defense contracting or government contracting side of the house. Uh, last year, we helped over a thousand veterans. Um, start businesses. Unfortunately, it's just like every other business out there. It's just like every other entrepreneurial venture out there. There's only about one in 10 that are actually going to work out, you know, right. um, and the rest have to change um, and or go to work for somebody else. So it's important just to get out and try and, and, and see what happens. So is there a cost associated with that warrior rising? No, um, no, it's absolutely free to veterans and their family members. Okay. Um, if you go to warrior, warriorrising.org um, and, and sign up and we'll put you through, put you into the next cohort or boot camp of business entrepreneurship. At the end of the process, if you're still part of um, Warrior Rising, you still have a, yep, there we are. And you still have a strong idea and a desire to go forth. We help you. Um, I've actually started an incubator space here in my facility. So we have dedicated office space for um, veterans and minority um, business owners that want to come in and just need a place to need a place to start from. So we allow that to happen here. We go out and help you market. We help you find funding. Uh, we help you grow through introductions to our vast network and and funding through SBA or funding through local banks or funding through um, a network of angel investors that we have out there. This year, we're doing what we call business showers. So we're taking every quarter, we're taking 12 high performing entrepreneurs and um, bringing them to a location like in March, we'll bring them here to uh, Salt Lake City. And uh, we've got some very special activities planned for those veterans. And I think so, yeah, so we're going to do that each quarter, um, starting here in Salt Lake City. Um, I want to go deeper, but I can't. And then we're going to Napa Valley, then we're going to do Las Vegas. And our final one will be at the Army-Navy game in, at MetLife Stadium um, at, the end of, at the end of 2021 in December. So wow. uh, if, you know any, if you know any veterans looking to uh, get into entrepreneurship, uh, push them my way. We'll get them into Warrior Rising and show you what we can do. No, absolutely. Absolutely. No, again, and, and we, um, you know, we, Again, like the VIB network, I told you, we promoted them really heavily uh, for their conference, which was great. I want to change. I have a question I like to ask people. Okay. Uh, and I really like this question because it pulls out some really unique answers. Your most recent purchase from Amazon that made you happy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I bought three things in the last Amazon transaction. One was a new bullet antenna for my truck because I was wiping snow off my truck yesterday or I don't know, last Friday and knocked this stupid antenna off. So uh -huh. I went and just Googled replacement antennas for a Toyota Tundra and this bullet popped up. And I was like, dude, that is awesome. I got to have a it. bullet. Yeah, I got, so I, I clicked on that little, like, it's like a little, a little 50 cal, like a six inch uh -huh. 50 cal bullet. Clicked on that. And when I clicked on that, then it took me to these decals, these American flag decals that go in your truck. So I bought, I bought some of those. Uh -huh. The final thing was um, uh, kind of cyber and defense security related, and that was a locking system for our for a garage door that separates our fourth bay from our third bay. Because our fourth bay is what we have dedicated for our Warrior Rising minority business um, startups, okay. and my security team has been very very um, worried. That, that we have nothing more than a than a roll up door, so I bought a really kick ass security system for that for that roll up door that I think is gonna uh, I think it's gonna blow their minds. Super simple, but I can't wait to show them. And I don't want to <laughs> say it out loud in case uh, it doesn't and they're unimpressed. <laughs> so, well, well, I'll you <laughs> well ho hopefully uh, you share with it before this comes out. <laughs> yeah, <absolutely. laughs> right. It hasn't yeah. arrived yet, has it? it? It's supposed to. It's supposed to be here today. So. Oh no, this won't. It, you still have probably three or four weeks before we come out this comes out all right perfect, perfect. You're, you're we, we, <laughs> we will, we will, we will no it's it's it just brings a lot of unique answers uh from people you learn about things that um again the questions that you don't even know to ask right because you yeah. don't know what's happening in a person's life and their story and so that, that just you know it brings out different answers it's i love it i love that i'm glad i, I don't know where i came from but i'm glad i, I integrated it now so again, as you're learning entrepreneurship, what are some of the things that helped you like as a new entrepreneur, some resources that maybe you could suggest to other people? Uh, are you part of any other organizations, things like that, 
that have helped you? Like, where do you turn to for your advice and mentorship and, and leadership? Yeah, so that that was, um, uh, luckily, I had a, a an entrepreneur within the family and my father-in-law. So okay. he, he taught me a lot. Um, he was ultimately my um, startup mentor. He had never done it the way that I wanted to do it before. So I'm sure that I scared the crap out of him in a lot of ways. But um, he... He, he showed me the ropes on, you know, startup, uh, not startup, that's the wrong word. He, he showed me the ropes on just running a business. Okay. And outside of that, I really didn't have a mentor and I wish that I had, which is why I got involved with Warrior Rising. So I got involved with Warrior Rising. I got involved with our local chambers. And I know there's a, there's a paid contingency to local chambers, but if you don't have the money and you just go and talk to these folks, they're going to point you to, they're going to point you to mentors within the community. It's going to help, that's going to help start up entrepreneurs without a without a fee associated to it the other place i found was the small business association in every state um they always have a a great they always have a lot of resources available to to veterans a lot of it is very very um basic um but it's a it's a great starting point and it's all about getting to know the people in your community that can help you and can provide that um mentorship capability. There's also an organization called PTAC for those folks that want to get into government contracting. So it's the Procurement Technical Assistance Center here in Utah. They're always associated with um, colleges. So maybe around um, the, your local community college or um, state-run university you could have a, a PTAC organization. Also, as an entrepreneur and the entrepreneurs that I've met all entrepreneurs like to talk about what they've created, what they've built and how they've done it. So um, I encourage anybody that's looking to start up in whatever space they want to start up as, and especially government contracting to go knock on a door, send an email, jump on LinkedIn, um, ask some questions. Cause I know anybody who has ever stopped and asked to talk to me about cybersecurity or government contracting, I've never said, no, I don't have time, <laughs> you know? Um, Tell me, tell me some of the stumbling blocks that I've hit. Like I, I'm, I'm always willing to share those stories. And anybody that's listening to this podcast or that has questions and want to reach out to me, like, um, feel free. I, I, I didn't hear any stumbling blocks. You tell me no. went straight up, man. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's Where's your stumbling awesome. blocks? I'm waiting for the stumbling blocks. I heard, I heard Nike rise. <laughs> right? I, yeah, I wish you it know? was. Simple. I that's, heard a Nike uh, rise. Cause... A lot of people look at it that way. Like, hey, you went from nothing to a $50 million contract. How is that possible? I'm like, well, it took it, it took the better part of it of, of 20 years of building that skill set, the capability, right. and and being trusted by those people around you. I, I can't I can't state enough how important trust is in, in a business relationship. If, if those people around you don't trust you, then you, you won't go anywhere, no matter what you know or who you're connected to. If you're, if, if they can't, if your customers and those people that you're gonna be working with can't trust you, then you might as well go work for somebody else because you're not gonna be a successful entrepreneur. I like it, I like it. Any favorite quotes, sayings? Oh, I had a um, Sun Tzu. And I'm going to screw it up. Um, <laughs> I like Sun Tzu. I like Sun Tzu. I like Sun Tzu a lot. My son's been reading him and I've read him. How old are your kids, by the way? Sorry to cut you off. I've got a, I've got a almost 21 year old daughter. Okay. And, um, she has twin brothers that are 13. So wow. 21 and 13. My wife, my wife and I planned on having one and, um, you know, the good Lord blessed us with two more eight years later. <laughs> so we were a little, a little unexpected about that. Uh, that's nice that's nice all right so go ahead tell me about sun tzu oh sun tzu so um i'm gonna paraphrase here but basically it's um keep your enemies close keep your friends close and your enemies closer you know if you if you know your if you know your enemy then you could you should you never have to fear them in battle right so mm. um that quote came up this weekend when i was talking to my business one of my business partners on the cyber side um about you know some of the weird things that are happening within the um, managed service provider space and, you know, how we navigate some of the relationships that we have out there, because a lot of the relationships that we have with MSPs on the cybersecurity side, um, they want a piece of the knowledge and capability on, on how to develop um, these cyber best practices for their, for their defense clients. Um, we have to be careful not to give away the farm. Uh, we have to be careful not to uh, allow them to, I, I don't want to say steal, but, you know, take our intellectual property and um, utilize it for their financial gain. Mm. 
So I rarely consider anybody, I don't consider anybody an enemy in this, in cybersecurity business right. because there's so much potential cyber business out there that there's not enough service providers. So I don't, I don't really view anybody as an enemy or a competitor in this space right now. There's plenty of room for all of us. Um, but we've worked hard to develop the solution that we're bringing our small business. And I want to make sure that it stays and remains our solution. Yeah, no, um, I, the cyber space, I can tell you that I have uh, people in my network that are program managers uh, right now for the government. And uh, there are cyber requirements that are they're not being able to fulfill with, you know, just like you said, there's just not enough providers to, to, to do that. So yeah, if anyone it's listening, fun. go into cyber. <laughs> All you kids out there listening and you're considering what career path to take, look into cyber. I, I, this yeah. is a big opportunity. I mean, there's already a gap right of, now in the amount of people, like you said, that we need and what we have. Yep. And Eric, one more thing on cyber. Um, last research I did last year, there was over 200,000 open cybersecurity jobs within the United States. 200,000. Worldwide, by 2022, they were predicting 1.5 million open, unfilled positions in, in the cyberspace. It's one of the highest paying industries in the United States. Um, unfortunately, we're trying to grow a business around college grads that are commanding $75,000 a year with no experience. And then, you know, they'll work for two years. And next thing you know, they're getting $100,000 offers from companies. And then two more two years later, they're up to 125 and, you know, they're barely even 30 years old. So um, when you're, when you suggest to your listeners to go into the cyber realm, it's not just kids, it's anybody. If you're looking anyway. for a career change, yeah, man, think about cyber. <laughs> if my business <laughs> fails, I might just go back to school and become a cybersecurity engineer. I don't know. That's it, right? <laughs> no, that's, that's not a bad bet. And I was, uh, I was in a room on Clubhouse uh, this weekend uh, where we're talking about STEM. And yeah. uh, like you said, the people there were all touting cyber and all the big companies, Google, Amazon, everyone, they've got programs for STEM for free to help people to come into this field, to, just to bring in the next, uh, the workforce, to build up the, the work, the base of, of people, cyber people. So yeah, I agree with you. This is, this is huge. Yeah. This is huge. Yeah. All right. I still didn't hear any of uh, those, those hard stories that you were going to Oh, share. the stumbling blocks you were talking I, about. You know, like I'm still waiting, man. You know, mm -hmm. I like when people say, you know, my overnight success only cost me 20 years, right? So yeah. I love it. And, <laughs> yeah. and I say that to people all the time is that uh, they go, man, you've been blowing up on YouTube and all this stuff. And I go, you know, I started making some videos like back in 2014. I mean, I didn't, they didn't, they didn't go anywhere, but I started recording and conceptualizing an idea back in 2012. I looked at some documents I wrote and I've been teaching government contracting since 2008 to people at a small yeah. level now i'm just on a bigger stage that's the, that's the yeah. difference so you know i think i think my stumbling block was getting laid off in 2010 okay. and going and trying to find another company or another job to work at and then finding that finding the job of the large prime and then getting basically fired from that job so those were uh, you know, I worked at a, as I was starting the company, I worked at the, at a ski hill foot, fitting boots on, you know, rich folks going, going skiing. And that was a very humbling experience for a 40 year old man, like putting boots on a 15, 16 year old kid that um, probably had more in the bank than I did at the time. <laughs> so I, I think, That's... you know, we've been so fortunate as an organization not to have hit any real large stumbling blocks, even in the midst of COVID, you know, on the cyber side, one of the, one of the services that we were bringing was consultative by nature. So we wanted to be in front of the customer. We, we wanted to be in their facility. We wanted to be helping them from the ground up, um, build their policies. But when COVID hit, we couldn't do that anymore. So we honestly thought that there was going to be, that we were going to lose the business, but you know, our team rallied together and we came up with a online solution that actually makes us a lot more scalable. And we can reach a lot more folks that, you know, maybe didn't want us in their facility or couldn't afford us to be in their facility. Now, instead of thousands of dollars for an expert, it's hundreds of dollars to talk to that same expert and you might not get the one-on-one -on -one that you wanted, but uh, we still keep those class sizes small. So if you want to talk to if you want to talk to the lead engineer, you can talk to the lead engineer. You might just have to wait five minutes. So I guess, I guess you know, there's been some stumbling blocks, but um, as as Hate Bay goes, as an organization goes, we've been so blessed and so um, just so lucky in so many different aspects that, yeah, I, I 
No, that's great. No, and there's a, and again, I mean, I I think uh, you said it best was hey, you put in twenty years of work to get here. Yeah, yeah. So you've got you had your on the job training. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. You had your on the job training. Uh, how can people reach you? What's the best way to people to reach you? Um, Website, platforms, LinkedIn. Yeah, email. LinkedIn earlier. Email, LinkedIn, social media. I'm on. I'm on all of them. All right. Um, I go by Ollie. It's A L L I. Uh, last right. name A B E Y. You can reach me. Email ollie yep. at hatesbay.com or ollie at totem.tech no that's great that's great and some final words for people that you want to think about some small business out here listening to this episode um, never never be scared to take that step you know the worst the worst thing that's going to happen for a for an entrepreneur or for a fledgling government contractor is you're going to end up working for somebody more than likely like you do today so um don't, don't be scared to get out there and try because the worst thing that's going to happen is you gain some experience and know how for the next, for the next shot at it. So, you know, thank you. And I appreciate your honesty. I, I really do uh, like the, the, that experience share that you gave uh, towards the end about the, uh, the ski boots. So I really do like that experience share because oh, yeah. I think a lot of, t- yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know it's true. Again, people only, the people that are recently coming to know you only know this Ali. And for me, uh, I've always said, I, I like people who've been through something yeah. and you, you did, you did, you know, you've been through some things and I, and I appreciate that uh, you sharing that with the folks. Cause I think it will help a lot more people be able to identify with you. Um, I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. And yeah, because was, there, uh, there's some people out here listening now that may be uh, working inside of a manufacturer facility <laughs> as well. <laughs> okay. On a midnight <laughs> shift. I don't know many people are putting on ski boots, but they're doing something else that could be very humbling. Uh, as well. There's there's probably very few people putting on ski boots in South Florida, but out, out no, here. yeah, exactly. We're, <laughs> well, I here did, in Utah, it's an everyday thing. But I did uh, I did have someone who that I recently trained. He's he's a new uh, BD guy that used to be uh, he would he I mean it was more fun, but he did he was like a like a caddy to billionaires and and like you know rich people in, in golf so. But yeah. again, he says, it, you know, the way he was treated wasn't that great. So it wasn't as exciting as it may seem. Yeah. I, <laughs> right. I, so it yeah. seems glorious, but it wasn't as glorious. So uh, I, thank you for my, listen, that. stay on. I'm gonna, we're going to just cut off the chat. Thank you everyone for listening today. I appreciate you coming on this episode and sharing with us your, some of your thoughts or ideas. And also, if you need to reach him, uh, you can reach the company Totem. That's T-O-T-E-M dot T-E-C. Thank you guys so much.